I'm Rob Lucuri, a senior editor at Gold Derby, here with Joshua Jackson, who stars in Dr. Death. Joshua, you play Christopher Dunch. Um, he's complicated, let's just put it that way. Uh, and as I watched the series, I was trying to understand this guy. Like, I went back and forth in my mind about what drove him psychologically. And I think a lot of that is the point in this show. Was he completely incompetent and lacking in any self-awareness or self-reflection? Or like, was he just simply a complete and utter sociopath or psychopath with delusions of grandeur? Where do you fall on that spectrum? Well, first off, that's great because that's exactly the intention, right? Is the, I don't think he's a psychopath, right? I don't think he was injuring with intent uh, or without regard to um, the pain and suffering that he was causing. I think in my uh, unqualified opinion, he falls more into the description you would have of a, a sociopath. And I think what, if I was able to do my job, the, the, I think the scarier version of him is the, the one where you don't know. Yeah. Because he could be, hopefully not your surgeon, but he could be your friend or that guy that you met or the guy you went to college with or your brother or your boyfriend or, you know, he should feel like somebody that you know that is recognizable. And, and if that's true and he's also capable of doing these unspeakably terrible things and not just doing them once and having the the human reaction, what you would hope a person would have is like, oh my God, I should never do this again. This is, I have, I have caused chaos in this person's body, but instead has the, the psychological wherewithal to push through that in service of his own ego and continue to push through in service of his own ego. I think that is a, is a much more terrifying uh, character, human. Yeah. And like, I mean, obviously he's arrogant and maybe you could even call him a malignant kind of narcissist, but that's a given. But frankly, mm -hmm. I would have been actually quite bored if the series had just painted him like that without any nuance. And there was something so unsettling about your portrayal of him because frankly, there were these uncomfortable glimpses into this man who maybe doesn't quite get what he's doing and, and maybe slightly felt slightly relatable even, which took me by surprise. I'm just wondering if you could talk us through those choices or, or maybe am I just a psycho for feeling that way? <laughs> <laughs> I, the whole point of the show was to put you into an existential crisis. So yeah, right. come. It did that. <laughs> um, no, no, I, I mean, I think first I wanna give credit to Patrick McManus because that was his good idea and insight is to you know, let's let's center the bad guy, right? Let's center the the black hat character, and in doing that, we are going to give ourselves the opportunity to get into so much more of his story, right? We tell you so much more of Christopher Dunch's story, even than the podcast does, which is primarily uh, interested with relating the the facts of the case, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. But for us, you know, the that opportunity, that amount of screen time allowed us to do exactly what you're saying was to to and i'm so happy to hear you say that at certain points you found yourself conflicted because you found yourself relating to this guy because he is a narcissist absolutely as frankly almost every good surgeon very good surgeon is and you kind of have to be and look in my line of work i recognize that there's a a place where delusion and ego is necessary right and it and it allows you to do things that a rational person would say, well, you don't know how to do that. How are you going to learn that? Like, you know, when I, when I signed on to do children of a lesser God, I didn't know how to communicate at all in sign language and said, yeah, I'm sure I'll be able to learn this entirely new language in a couple of months. No problem. Like a reasonable person would say that's ridiculous, but a delusional actor will be like, of course I can do that. So, you know, Dunch takes pieces of you and me and everybody that we recognize and that are necessary in our ability to survive and function and thrive in life. And then because of his particular, uh, the, you know, the, his particular makeup, his, plus his environment, plus his exposure to a system that is 
literally built for men like him to succeed. So he's given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity because he checks the literal boxes of, of what he is supposed to be. All of that melange comes together to create this, I think, truly terrifying man and hopefully terrifying portrayal of a man where you go, obviously outcome terrible, but I think I recognize me or someone I know. And if that, if I, if I do recognize that, am I the psycho? Are, are we all a little bit psycho? Like it, can I not, do I not have the ability to actually separate the dangerous from the not dangerous. Like if this guy, if one of his facets was, yeah, I could totally see myself like sitting at a bar, having a drink with him. And then also he then goes to work and mangles a body and then comes back and has another drink, like nothing. It, like, am, it, am I lacking the tools necessary to be able to separate the good from the bad? So I, I thought that that portrayal, you know, that on the page portrayal, which was already there was, incredibly challenging and i you know it was a challenging as an audience member challenging as an actor and an incredible opportunity to to not just you know he's not darth vader he's not a bad guy that's right. he's a he's a deeply deeply fucked up complicated yeah. human being which is everywhere um yeah <laughs> yes like that's the beauty of the show like i didn't know what I was getting into. And yeah, by the end of it, I was just so riveted by the whole story. And honestly, casting you as Dunch was a masterstroke. I'm glad you ended up with the role. Um, obviously, uh, after some time, you, you came to the project a little later. Um, because if you don't mind me saying, and I, I mean this honestly, the perception of you sometimes is as a, like a non-threatening, down-to-earth, charismatic kind of guy, perfect to play someone like you, because that's what he was. Um, and yet you were able to give this very unsettling kind of vibe about him until it became quite plain that he was beyond redemption. And so then thinking right. on those lines, what kinds of things, apart from the podcast and reading source material, what kinds of things were you having to do to prepare to get into that mindset? Well, the first thing, um, and thank you, I'll take the compliment because I agree with you, um, but for first thing, um, the first thing that I had to do was get out of the way of my own judgment, right? right. By the, the upside of joining the project late was all the scripts were written and the podcast obviously already existed. The downside of that was that all the scripts were written and the podcast already existed. So I had all this material to dive into. So I essentially approached the project the first time almost as an audience member. Right. Rather than reading it with my actor's hat on, I read it with my audience hat on and really despised this guy by the end and wanted I found myself wanting to do the psychologically safe thing of like, well, clearly he's a psychopath. And if we just don't let psychopaths practice medicine, then everything's OK. <coughs> and oh, excuse me. <coughs> and so it took me a second to. Uh, well, and through conversations with Patrick, really get to the place of like, okay, if he's not a psychopath and if he is actually a real live living, breathing human being who absolutely has delusions of grandeur and absolutely has traits of narcissism, but if at the center of it is a man seeking actually to become the image that he has of himself which I think is something that almost every human being can relate to at some point in their life. And if you marry that with his, you know, progressively more delusional, but, but his heroic sense of self, <clears throat> you know, I think Dunch really thought that he was the hero of a, of a, of a grand story. And yeah. as he gets farther and farther and farther from actually being a hero inside of the story, the pressure of maintaining that fiction increases and increases and increases and increases. And, you know, in some ways I was aided in this and the fact that he is, you know, he physically wears that disconnection over the course of the, se of the, of the series, right? You, you literally see it weighing on his body. You know, I don't, I don't generally try to like conceive of myself from the outside too much, but what you were saying about, you know, if there's a perception of me out there, it's that, that I play, you know, recognizable people, right? And it, it there is a, 
there is a quote that I think about often from a movie from JFK where Nixon is looking at the portrait of JFK on the wall and he says, they look at you and they see who they wanna be and they look at me and they see who they are. And I remember seeing that as a kid and it's just stuck with me for my entire career. Like I want to be the second thing. I always wanna play people that you, you, you know, that you recognize, that you feel you could walk a mile in their shoes. And, and what I think is brilliant about casting a guy like me and then the way that they, the character was written in, in something like Dr. Death is since that's my desire as an actor always, right? To find the truth in this person. If we're trying to find the truth in this really, really problematic, challenging person, but we start from there, even knowing that the story is going to go to this outlandish place, if we can get you as an audience member, even for a second, to feel like you can relate to this person, it is going to be so much more conflicting as you get to the, the past redemption part, as you put it. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much going on there that um, you don't really see coming. Uh, and uh, and I felt so satisfied by how the show concludes. That's, that's because, awesome. I love hearing that. Yeah, because it's earned, right? We've gone through so much of this harrowing ride with some pretty horrifying material. And I felt like when it ended, I was, I was good. I was done. And I felt really, it was amazing. And then it was time to move on because I, it was like almost like I had to wash it away because it was just so hard. Gosh, I, I, I felt it's so, so it's, I, one, that's great to hear. Cause I, you know, we put these things out in the world and you never know how they're going to resonate or if they're going to resonate. Um, but I will also tell you my personal experience, you know, you lead up to something, you have an idea, it becomes its own thing as you're doing it. And in the midst of it, and God bless my lovely wife for giving me the space, I don't think that I realized quite how heavy it was weighing on me mm -hmm. until the day after the uh, my final day, I woke up and I literally remember being like, I feel a hundred pounds lighter. I just like my, I was weary in my bones from carrying around that the, the cognitive dissonance of that man. I mean, playing scenes where any human's empathetic response to a person in pain or any decent human's empathetic response is to, is to have empathy, right? To, to try to ameliorate that pain, to try to help, or at least to understand where that pain is coming from. And to play a character who instead of seeing another human saw only a connection to themselves, Right. So it, it inverted the human response that you would have to anything large and small, whether it be paralyzing your best friend and being annoyed with him for being paralyzed because this was going to reflect poorly on you or getting into an argument with the, the mother of your future mother of your child because it would hurt the inconvenience of her pregnancy was going to impact like your ability to do what you wanted to do awful, awful things, but like, but keeping that, keeping the logic tr chain alive of that man who would have those reactions. So hopefully you don't see me acting out the moment. It just is, you know, it happens in yeah. the moment. Keeping that alive in my head for six months really weighed heavily on me. Wow. <clears throat> see, cause it's easier said than done to say, yeah, I played a character. We've moved on now. I can just get on with my life, but you're a human being. You have feelings, you have emotions, you know, you dream, you whatever. And so I, I, I always imagine, do these performers actually carry this stuff with them a little as they're playing them? And then perhaps after it, it sounds like you did have that. And this is really heavy material. And I'm not surprised. It's uh, it. And it's heavy material on a, on a couple different layers. You know, there's a, there's the, just the aspect of responsibility is heavy. Right, these you're talking about real people's lives, and for the people who are deceased, their families are still alive. So this pain exists in the world currently. So you have a responsibility to, if you're going to tell the story of their loved ones' lives, even tangentially, you have a responsibility to tell that story in a in a manner that is uh, both respectful and adds something to the conversation. Right. So you're you're not forcing them to go through a re-sensationalized version of their their family member's life and then there's the just the you know the responsibility of, of work and being responsible to the people that you're working for and when you take on a show like this 
you know, as a, as a leading man, you have a responsibility to creating an environment for people to be able to create in. And then there's the deepest level, which is, and, and you know, I used to not believe that this was true when I was younger. I, I think I wanted it. I wanted to have it the way that you just described, right? I wanted to be able to like, yeah, and then you're done work and you walk away and that's it. But as I've gotten older, I realized there, as much as I try to keep a conscious psychological separation that's a conscious choice. Your body doesn't know the difference between a, an acted emotion and an emotion. If you're feeling it, you're feeling it. So if, if you're going through this emotional journey, some part of your subconscious being is actually experiencing that fear, that anger, that tra all of those things. And in some ways it's good because you're getting it out of your system, but in some ways, you know, you're leaving those scars on yourself and they stick with you. Absolutely. And yeah, and that's, it's almost refreshing to hear because it's honest. It's just a really honest way of, ex of explaining how these roles affect you, just like any job affects yeah, the way exactly. you operate. So given all of that um, and, and, you know, the work that you had to put in, obviously Patrick McManus, the showrunner creator, um, had a lot to do with the success of the show. What did you most appreciate or, and or value about what he brought to the table? I'm so tempted to be sarcastic here because I, I have a, an absolute like romance with Patrick. Yeah. Um, and if he were here, I would fry him with a question <laughs> like that. But since he's not, I'll be honest. I, love it. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the first starts with the page, right? So he wrote, he had, he had, a, I think, a brilliant insight into how to tell this story, right? To not make it a rehashing of the podcast and not just make it a simple, um, who done it? Yeah. But I think he had a really, a really wise insight into the most compelling way to approach this story. So first we start with the page, and then we get into the man. Like being an executive producer is a pretty miserable job, honestly. Even though um, lots of people would shoot their mother for that job, but uh, I certainly wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And I also wouldn't wish it during a pandemic on my oh, no. worst enemy. So. If there ever was a time where you could give somebody a little leeway for being a dickhead, it would be under the pressure circumstances that he was under. And it's just not the place that he comes from. You know, he, he is very confident in the quality of the of the material that he wants to put on camera. So which is the best place to work from and also willing and open to be uh collaborative and and still curious you know what's on the page is probably what's going on camera but there's still space for exploration and spontaneity um which is not always necessary but in the times where something beautiful comes out of it can really you know like indelible moments come out of sometimes unexpected places and he also you know created a a a psychological space for, for myself, certainly, but I think for everybody on set to feel comfortable in telling this, this scary movie, right? This, this terrifying story in the midst of a very scary time, right? Yeah. Every day that we were at work, the, the tacit and explicit understanding of us being there together was that we were all responsible for each other's literal lives. Yep. Right. Like when I go home from work, I need to know that I am inside of my quarantine bubble so that I'm not bringing this disease home. But I also need to know that you're doing that and you're doing that and you're doing that and that a hundred times over. And for him to create a space where there was calm leadership at the top so that everybody could respond to his sense of like, don't worry, we got this. We're going to figure it out as we go together. And and I don't think that this show would have been possible with a, a different showrunner. I just, yeah, he's just a mensch. He's a, he's a wonderful man. He's a, he's a very good writer and he's an extremely good showrunner an unusually good, in my experience, showrunner. Yeah, <clears throat> that's really refreshing to hear. And everyone I speak to these days, the stakes are already so high on a set for any production to have COVID as well. I mean, with all the stakes are high for all of us, but yeah. um, sets in particular, that's been a really interesting um, insight to hear from people like yourself. Final question before we go. It seems an obvious question, but I'm curious to know 
how you feel about the way the show has been received. The critics are really on board. You, you received a Critics' Choice nomination for it, which I'm so happy to see you included in that group. Me too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you were. I hope the Emmys are next. And um, yeah, well, how do you feel about that? Because it's, it was actually really well received and a lot of the praise, let's be honest, was on you. And so how do you feel about that? Man, I feel great about that. I, I, as we said a little bit earlier that you do these things, right? And I've had the, the, the wonderful benefit of, of doing this for a long time, working on very good projects, working on very mediocre projects and occasionally working on very bad projects. So you know, you never make something bad by intention. And in the same way, I don't think you can ever, uh, or I wouldn't ever want to pin my hopes for a show on the type of response that we got to this show. You know, you, I, I have to focus on telling the story, being the character, and then let it be whatever it is. But that being said, I will, you know, I'm very proud of the work that I did here. So I am very happy that, something that I'm very proud of got the type of reception that it did because it means more people will have the opportunity to watch it, frankly, right? That it, that it doesn't just fall down the memory hole and, and go away forever. And, you know, I think the, the story that Patrick told, I'm proud of my own work, but I think that the cast as a whole, you know, it takes everybody being in a cohesive unit to make, to pull something like this off because the second something, you know, the second someone smells off in a scene, the whole thing just starts to unravel. And, and it's a very delicate dance that you're doing at all times to try and to, to try and bring you as an audience member along for this ride where your brain is trying to reject so much of it at all the times, right? Like there's so much of this that you just don't want to have to accept as an audience member. And so for all of those reasons, you know, I'm 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 gratified, but I'm mostly just really happy that we got the reception that we did. And I obviously was over the moon to get the Critics' Choice nomination because, again, you know, for me, for the show, for Christian, it just it's it's satisfying. I'm not going to lie, it's nice to to uh, be recognized by your peers, but it also, you know, it, it it is just that final stamp of like, yeah, man, we did something that we can be really proud of. You know, I felt the same way about when they see us when it. You know, I watched that show. I was like, you know, I have my little piece in that. I'm like, this is a masterpiece. This is a really intensely, uniquely, I may never get to be in another thing like this in my entire career. And I sort of feel the same way with Dunch. You know, the, there's only so many of those characters that come across your desk in a career. And so to have the opportunity, not just to play the guy, but to have the whole show be as good as it is and then to have it go out in the world and actually get the reception that you would hope for it has been an amazing experience. Mate, I can totally imagine. Thank you for terrifying the shit out of me and <laughs> I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Much appreciated. <laughs>